We are very fortunate to have today um, a, a chemist from Czechoslovakia, so I'm excited about this. Um, Peter Justa is at GMA Art. He's Vice Dean for Science and International Affairs, the Faculty of Restoration at the University of Pardubici in Czechoslovakia. He was born in 1955. He's a graduate of the Department of Chemical Technology of Monument Conservation in the Prague Institute of Chemical Technology and a much published expert in the conservation uh, in conservation techniques. He is a conservation scientist specializing in the conservation of architecture and a fully licensed restorer of stone and stucco. Long, he's a long-term member of the Commission for Conservation and Restoration and the Czech Ministry of Culture and a former chair of the board of directors at the Institute for Restoration and Conservation Techniques at Lidi Mosul. He is currently the director of the Department of International Projects for the GMA Art Group Corporation and since 2009 the Vice De Dean for Science and International Affairs at the Faculty of Restoration at the University of Pardubici. He's, he has studied and or been engaged in the restoration of important Czech monuments like the major Bohemian cathedrals, Baroque palaces in Prague, historic Jewish cemeteries, and many other monuments both in the Czech Republic and abroad. He is currently mainly engaged in the study and rehabilitation of an ancient citadel in Erbil and other monuments in Iraq as a contractor for UNESCO projects. Please join me in uh, welcoming uh, uh, Dr. Yusta. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here with you. It was a long journey here. Thank you, Elizabeth, for in kind invitation. Thank you, Rima, for the invitation. So these are two persons who uh, connected me in Prague, and I feel very, very happy to be here again with you. Uh, First important information for you is that I am not an architect. <laughs> and my, my, my presentation will be from a completely different perspective. And I hope you will enjoy the uh, monuments in Prague and, uh, uh, and in Bohemia. And I will try to uh, explain the uh, general aspects of conservation. I will have to mention some chemistry, I apologize in, in advance. <laughs> and uh, then I prepared also some case studies to document better in three very typical uh, uh, objects that we have restored recently. Well, this is the uh, first slide is uh, uh, Charles Bridge and Sunrise looking to the old city of Prague and uh, the, the place where I spend a lot of time every year <laughs> because I, besides I am a uh, part, uh, partner for the uh, Prague Town Hall to uh, maintain and look after about the Charles Bridge. Uh, let me introduce myself more and to, to, uh, to add some information uh, for, for Andrew presentation. Uh, this is city of Lido Michel. it's a UNESCO heritage site and uh, uh, our faculty of restoration is situated here in these two objects. Uh, the, uh, the castle that you can see here, this is the Renaissance castle from 16th century decorated with uh, beautiful Italian graffito. Uh, our headquarters of faculty is right here, so we have very good connection with uh, history. And uh, all our studios are situated in Piarist uh, Monastery, which is just 50 meters away. This is our building. Uh, uh, this is uh, a 17, uh, early 17th century building. And we are so happy that we could hire from the Piarist order, which they are not use anymore this, this object and uh, we are very happy also because it's uh, the, the monastery is decorated with, with a lot of mural paintings so students are inside let's call damaged 
situation so they can observe how processes in conservation, weathering, how can uh, how uh, how they uh, uh, they are growing and uh, they they can use also these uh, these uh, these paintings as a as a study objects as a case studies object. Uh, we try to study to 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 make the education as interdis interdisciplinary. So we, we divide our study into three parts. We have uh, humanities education. We have education of natural sciences, and of course, the main topic of education is artistic training. Uh, we have actually four studios, four branches of study. We have uh, conservation of stone, conservation of wall paintings and graffito, paper, book binding and documents, conservation studio, and the last is artworks on paper and related materials. It is, it, this is a new branch of study that started to be active in 2003, just after 2002, a very big flooding in uh, Old Bohemia, where the uh, archives and uh, and depositories with uh, art were flooded, and there was a very urgent need to have a good experience uh, restores to uh, to uh, treat this material. As was mentioned, also I'm uh, part of uh, Gemma Art Company, which is a quite big company in Prague dealing with uh, historic monuments and we are specialized in architecture, mainly architecture. Uh, we were awarded uh, in recent times by several awards, it's Europe and Nostra Awards, and there are two castles that uh, we did in the uh, last decade. Uh, this is uh, Castle Kinjewart, which was sentenced to be demolished in 1985 because of very, very bad condition and it was uh, uh, it, it was possible to to restore it to this uh, position, and that's why the the uh, was it, it was awarded. Uh, this the the lower uh, uh, picture is uh, a castle of Nelaozevas, which is uh, Lobkovitz castle, and it comes uh, from 16th century with uh, a lot of figures, graffitos, and. Uh, it's also a very important object. Uh, this uh, object, Wannstein Palace, is the, the largest Baroque palace, uh, Baroque palace in Prague. Uh, the students who visited Prague uh, visited also the interiors of the palace, and this was our major work ever. St. Vitus Cathedral was, uh, this is a permanent work site, as any cathedral in the world, and I had the privilege to restore the main tower in 2000, in, in 2000, which is the, the, the major Gothic town in, in Bohemia. This is St. Barbara Cathedral in Kutna Hora, which is about uh, 50 kilometers east of Prague. And uh, this was a large project, the biggest project for the cathedral for Gemma Art Company, and it lasted uh, eight years, since 2002 until 2008, and I will speak more as it this will be my uh, one of the case studies later on. This is Nostitz Palace, the site of Ministry of Culture. Uh, the, the restoration was uh, done in two years uh, between 2001-2002. Uh, this is the uh, Romanesque chapel in the Het Castle. This is the uh, this is uh, easternmost uh, castle of Friedrich the Second Barbarossa. It's, uh, it's a castle from 12th century, and uh, with this unbelievably preserved chapel, this is double story chapel, with uh, beautiful figural decorations, stone decoration. You see this high quality decoration from 12th century. And last but not least, this is a, a huge uh, a church, Baroque church in Olomouc, uh, where uh, there were complete uh, conservation of mural paintings on the ceiling. A couple of words uh, uh, for what, the, uh, what we think about, how we think about conservation and uh, what are, how we are feel the general principles. 
the conservation should be of minimum possible interventions and maximum possible preservation. So the, the main topic of any um, treatment we do is to save the original material as much as possible. Preventive conservation is the first step what we should do. The pre prevention is the, the basic, is a general aspect of any conservation and uh, we can say that if, if they would be good maintenance there is no need to restore it of course. And uh, how and what is to preserve? It's to preserve, it's to, to, uh, to save the monuments against water. Water is the general aspect. If there is, if we would, if uh, the water is not in the material, there is no processes, no chemical processes, no biological processes, and uh, the, the material is stable. Once the water comes inside in any form, uh, humidity, the uh, rainwater, whatever, so they start, it starts processes and it starts de to deteriorate the material. Uh, preventive conservation has uh, several aspects. Uh, regular inspection, monitoring, installation warning system during uh, uh, also the, uh, uh, the, the warning system for uh, unusual uh, events, uh, uh, prevention of water pen uh, penetration, architectural improvements, and the uh, most important thing is, as I already mentioned, is regular maintenance. The last possible thing that we sometimes have to do is to replacement of original statues to, uh, to make copies, replicas, what is uh, actually has been done in Charles Bridge, for example. Charles Bridge has about 32 statues and still uh, 14 statues are original from Baroque times and the rest has been replaced. First replacement was in 1908 already, so it's been 100 years long operation and depending on the status of the, of the condition of each statue and every year there is a commission looking uh, around the bridge and uh, choosing what, what's, what's next. The most easy prevention, preventive conservation is to cover it and uh, this was a long discussion to make people think about covering during the winter. We have no such a beautiful weather like you have here. <laughs> and since October till, let's say, end of March, we have a lot of rain, snow, frost, all together. And uh, this is where the monuments suffer a lot. And, uh, but Prague is very much visited also during winter, and town hall doesn't want to cover what is visited, you know. So this is never ending fight. But sometimes we, we manage to, to win and some, let's, let's say, like this phone then is, can be covered and this is the best how to save the monuments. If we speak about conservation of architecture, uh, there, is, there are some uh, unavoidable steps in, in conservation. First of all is good assessment. Uh, if you, if you de don't have a good assessment, you don't have a good project, you don't have a good restoration. And then there are steps as follows, cleaning, desalination, salts are everywhere, you know, structure consolidation, replacement if necessary, filling gaps, grouting, injection of uh, cracks, then to restoration, restoration of uh, surface layer or paint, in, paint layers, and preventive conservation means in this way uh, water repellency, water repellent treatment. And last but not least is maintenance plan because we have to give the owner the idea how to maintain, not to be uh, uh, endangered ag again. I have a couple of uh, images about salts now just to illustrate. Salts are present in everywhere, every country, every soil. We cannot avoid uh, salts. Uh, even more, we have soils that are creating on the surface because uh, uh, particularly in Central Europe and in the industrial area, the rain is not rain, it's acid rain with some acidity and uh, acid rain reacts with calcium carbonate, which is the base of the, of the limestones. And uh, so uh, 
the, the result of uh, the calcium a carbonate and acid rate is uh, this kind of crystals. This is calcium sulfate, which is gypsum mineral. And if you see the shape, so it will push towards all porous. And this is why the the result of uh, this uh, this intervention is, is uh, scrambling of the uh, stone. It's complete deterioration of the stone. We have, uh, as I mentioned, we have long winters and we use salt for salting roads. And this is another source, important source of, of salt. There are crystals of uh, sodium chloride, which is not so dangerous like uh, gypsum, but anyway, it's, uh, it's, it still has, has a crystallization power more uh, and uh, there is uh, another aspect of uh, chloride is a hygroscopic. It means that attracts humidity from the air to expand and to have uh, even more power to uh, to deteriorate the the, uh, the stone. There are some images about the fluorescence that uh, visually damage also the the surface of stone, but. This is the way how the salt is going to uh, to, to destroy uh, the the surface. Also, it happens on stucco, on stucco, uh, and there is a list of main decays uh, that are caused by soluble salts. There are first of all changes in physical properties, decrease of mechanical strength, de decrease of of stability. Formations of crust on the surface, we call it gypsum crust, and the crust is not just a pure gypsum. The gypsum attracts the humidity, attracts um, uh, oil particles, it attracts uh, suits, attracts anything you can imagine that can be in the air, and uh, the result is not a white stuff, but is a very black, very thick and impermeable for water uh, layer that is preventing to any breathing of the stone. Uh, color changes and increase of moisture content, I already mentioned that uh, some uh, salts are hygroscopic like chlorides or nitrates. And how, uh, how does it work, the, the salt crystallization and recrystallization? In every object there is a crystallization zone because the salt is crystallizing when it starts to dry. So if uh, the stone is wet, so there is no or very little crystallization. When it's completely dry, most of the time you see the, the, the shape is more or less good. But this is the area of the crystallization zone where the water is moving up and down and it's uh, melting the salt and uh, drying the salt and then drying the salt it crystallizes. Uh, this is a Gothic uh, church from around 1400s and uh, this is very nice uh, illustration of what I have said because the prof profiles of the portal are almost exact in the upper part and going down it's it's melting. It's like uh, there is almost no visible profilation, no visible edges of anything because of the rising damp that, they are, that is pushing the soluble salts from the ground. This is, you, you can see this is not very <laughs> connected, but I, I, I use it also because this is not only the case of uh, wet countries. This is a uh, far in the desert. We, we had a project uh, that uh, we, we prepared a project in Syria for desalination of Palmyra monuments. Fortunately, due to the uh, due to the war, has been cut everything. Uh, but you will see that even in a very dry desert area, there is still some water underneath, and it's uh, like not it's sucking up to very very high position. And you see the uh, the solar fluorescence down here. And this all was eaten in 2000 years continuously. And this is nothing but the salt crystallization. Of course, there is some 
wins and uh, some abrasion. But the main reason why this, it ha does it, this has happened is salt crystallization. This is our dean. <laughs> and uh, you see that the crystallization starts according to the layers of sedimentation. So the sedimentation layer are always, uh, uh, they are uh, stronger and uh, softer parts and the softer parts are very easily, easily uh, attacked and uh, the disintegration starts according to these layers. We are back in, in Czech Republic now, so uh, the rising damp is a principal uh, problem of any, any uh, monuments and uh, our task is to, to eliminate the, uh, the rising damp as much as possible. This is a, a small street narrow, near the uh, Charles Bridge, so it means near the, the, uh, the river uh, Vltava. And just for the illustration, the height of the rising damp is approximately 4 meters. So the capillary rise, in, 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 if they have enough humidity, enough water underneath, so the, the capillary can uh, suck to the really, really high uh, position. And uh, I want your point your interest that, see, there is uh, algae growth, not here and not up. And because also algae needs very uh, exact uh, load of humidity and light here. And so uh, also algae can move up and down according to the height of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the humidity. And uh, algae, as you know, is the first step in the uh, biological attacks. Once you have algae, it tracks humidity, it tracks the uh, um, uh, how to say, uh, dust. Dust is, uh, uh, is uh, like, it's, uh, like uh, media for growing more, so you start with mosses, then higher plant, and, and the rest is <laughs> complete destruction. So this is also a very dangerous aspect of all this. Uh, Particularly this building is probably the last very important building in Prague that has not been conserved yet because of some, I don't know with what reason, <laughs> probably ownership. But I, I, I like it because this was Prague in, uh, let's say, 1910. And uh, I always uh, bring my students here to, to see and to see how uh, the, uh, the weathering of building happens. Because now in Prague it's a problem that you, you cannot show <laughs> the, the, the real destruction. But it's not destruction, this is uh, really aging of a building, including what I said, uh, rising dam, but cracks in the, in the, above the portal. Uh, there are very many aspects of weathering, of aging, of old architecture. This is another, uh, what uh, not many people know, that uh, this is St. Peter, Paul, Cathedral and Brno, and the uh, combination of different rocks can bring uh, serious problems, and particularly combination of limestone and sandstone. As I said, limestone reacts with acid rain to create calcium sulfate. And limestone was very much used by stone cutters because it's softer material and sandstone. It was much easier to cut something. So, and they, that, that's why they used, the base was made in, in sandstone. And the, the, the most complicated elements, architectural elements were carved from limestone. And, uh, the limestone is white not because it, it is clean, but because the first layer was uh, it, it, it was uh, uh, melted or oh, not melted? It's not. Huh? Yes, melted. <laughs> and was uh, the first layer was was washed out, and uh, uh, the the calcium uh, carbonate was 
change into calcium sulfate and was deposited in this position. And in, only in this position the crystals are created. So you see that uh, this uh, shape is more or less good, but what is very much deteriorated is the sandstone. In this case, it's already substituted by water. If we have the same uh, element, which is completely carved from sandstone, there is nothing wrong here. You see that's absolutely perfect condition. So, uh, all it means that also architects must think about how to, to make a combination, because sometimes you have to do a combination because there is some order, some, because somebody wants to make combination of stones, because it, it's also nice sometimes. So this is a very uh, important aspect that you, you, can, you have to keep in mind. This is the uh, little castle from 15th century in Kutna Hora, and uh, this is a profilation of one portal. And this was repaired by cement in 1920s and was perfectly done. Nobody could see that it's not stone. It was really excellent work, but the permeability, the porous system was closed of the, by, by the cement. And you could, at the end, take it like, uh, like cakes from, uh, from the box, the, the pieces of uh, the, what was added in, in, uh, in, uh, in this case in 80 years. And you see how does it work? This is a cement part and uh, the area just below the unpermeable uh, layer is completely deteriorated. It's just a sand. This is not, this is not no power to, 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 be, to, to keep together. This is what we call microclimate under the impermeable uh, layer, which can happen also uh, under the black crust. This is a gypsum crust I, I was speaking about before, or by very inappropriate uh, treatment. This is acrylic uh, paint that covered uh, the, the stone and uh, the water that has to evaporate from the ground was uh, blocked and then uh, the start to peel up, peel away the, the first layer and the algae started to grow under the, in, in the interlayer. But so this were some aspects, uh, some aspects that are most dangerous for, for stone and stucco and how to treat it. This is uh, how we clean. I prepare three uh, methods for cleaning. Uh, from the soft to the very uh, intensive. And uh, this is uh, cleaning of, uh, this is a Jewish cemetery markers from all Jewish uh, cemetery in Prague, which were very intensively covered by, again, gypsum crusts. So first of all, we start to mechanically clean the, the first layer, the, the, in the, the thick layer. And once it's clean, to, but never we can never touch with scalpels or chisels to the, to the stone itself. So we just go under to leave some remnants of earth crust uh, on, on, the, on the stone. And then we make a, a poultice. Poultice can be uh, distilled water, it's very slow. Or we use ammonium bicarbonate. It's 10% of ammonium carbonate. It's very soft chemical. Uh, it's used for uh, baking powder, for example, you know, and I like this method very much because it's it's very slow. I like slow processes in conservation because slow processes you can control. If you do something very fast, you lose your uh, in, you lose your uh, 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 control under on, under the under the process, and the results are pretty good. This is uh, before and after. It's, you, you will see a big difference if you, if you do very slow processing in, in cleaning and the poticing, I, it's my really favorite. If I have time, I, I do like this. The second uh, uh, method I like to use is uh, what we call JOS system. 
And this is a abrasive system. I don't know if it's used in the United States, but in Europe it's very, very common. And uh, look at the sketch here. This is uh, the, the, the particles are not directed radially, but ta tangentially. So it, uh, they, the impact to the, to, the, to the surface is not direct, it's not so hard and it's going in the, in the circle, it's like uh, using rubber. And it's very soft and very, very well, uh, we, we, we have very good, uh, very good uh, results. The only problem here is that we also have to use a lot of water. So we wet a lot the, the support, which can make some problem. And, uh, uh, And uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, method that I use very, very often, but sometimes we can avoid this method. This is laser cleaning system. This is on um, sine vitus cathedral. There was a one principal problem. The sine vitus cathedral was painted in 18, uh, 17th century, 18th, uh, around 1700s. Uh, before the coronation of Friedrich II, and they painted the, 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 the old stone on the violet color, not very nice, but it's a part of history. And we, we discovered that if we start to clean this gypsum crust, we clean also the, the paint layer, because the adhesion between the crust and paint layer was much bigger than between this original stone and the paint layer. So that's why we made some tests for cleaning and then the whole facade was cleaned by laser and they are cleaning. Uh, this is very effective, also very well controlled because you, you, will, you can set up different energy, cruising energy and this is also a slow method. And, uh, but, uh, Restorers can afford this method very exceptionally because it's a very expensive method, particularly if you clean all facade. If you clean small uh, statue, it's possible. We have, in, in our school, we have two laser, uh, but uh, we use it exclusively for small pieces, for small stone sculpture. And this is what I was speaking about. So these are the remnants of uh, paint. The, which is uh, lime paint, and uh, uh, this is how uh, the, the difference between a cleaned and uncleaned area. And you may remember <laughs> this line <laughs> is <also laughs> very controversial, but uh, we just want to, s to show you uh, that we can very easily control here uh, the, the, the speed of, of cleaning and uh, the reason why I'm also a fan of uh, uh, laser cleaning is that we do not have to clean completely, 100% dirt. We just need to let the pores open for breathing, to let the water evaporate out from the, uh, from the, uh, from the stone. And this is uh, scanning electron microscope uh, images and you see this part is completely sealed with gypsum crust and this part is already clean and open and the pores are open and even though you see the pieces of dirt so we can forget it because uh, this doesn't uh, this doesn't affect uh, the uh, the condition of the stone of course using laser we can do it may also damage so if we use the intensive stream of laser, we can really make a very, very wide, <laughs> but without any uh, historical uh, aspects. And uh, so there are two approaches. This is uh, uh, just a test, but if you go to France, you will see that there's a lot of country are completely wide. And this is what, uh, this is a now work. Uh, it's, uh, 13th century church and it's been uh, cleaned to the point that still make a sense of very old history uh, sculpture. So there are also uh, different approaches and different uh, uh, possibilities in nice cleaning in the way. 
Uh, National Gallery in Prague was flooded in 2002 very intensively and I had the privilege to be uh, 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 part of the restoration team uh, for, for cleaning. And this was flooded, but I want to illustrate here how we deal with something that is very humid and how, to, how we extract soils from, from the buildings. So this is the uh, church uh, soon after the flood, you see the, the, the mud on the floor here. And uh, this is the uh, uh, convent, the cloister of the convent. So if we do not uh, have uh, historical mortars, I mean Gothic mortars, then we cannot do this work. But these, these mortars, these uh, layers were from 19th century already. So in this case, we had to remove the the the, the mortar from uh, from the uh, walls. In the in the places where there were no mortar, we uh, make drilling in joints to open as much as possible the space for sucking the, the moisture from, from the, from the uh, walls. And uh, soon after the wall was drying, the salt <laughs> was coming out. And you see the, there is almost nothing and when it's drying, how, how the fluorescence is growing to the complete whitish uh, field on the, on the wall. And so we had to wrap in the uh, cellulose all <laughs> building uh, several times and, uh, and try to suck the, the soluble source from, from the depths. And, uh, but we have to stop in the certain point, otherwise we could suck years and years and years. So uh, the, the intensity was uh, decreasing just to slow down the speed of, uh, of uh, uh, the, the salt is going to the, to the surface. And it really happened. It took one year, then the gallery came back and you see the same space uh, in last year, already this year, this spring. And uh, this is uh, the result. And you may be interested why it's not completed, why it's not painted. And this is, was the decision of the uh, historic architect of the, the Institute of Carol Monuments. Because, uh, as I mentioned, these uh, mortars were not original and were badly done. Because they were very, very uh, dense and very difficult, so we also were facing the problem of evaporation. And so that's why we used the uh, uh, perfect now, from point of view of uh, particle size distribution of the grain, uh, the, uh, the mortar. And you see the detail, if it's very open, very open to breeze, and once they get more funds, so they, they can complete the, the rest. But for this particular case, it was important to do it as fast as possible and to open the space for public uh, again. This is a paradise garden and uh, some uh, retouching of the, of, the, of the pillars. This is a Palace Beethoven. This is another uh, uh, possibility how they treat this uh, humidity. And this was a big mistake. I, I mean, we visited together too. So uh, we uh, use sometimes what we call sacrificial mortar, which is a mortar that uh, attracts uh, salts, and, uh, but it's, it's much more dense than normal. And uh, in this case, uh, we have to uh, think about how strong is the stream of water going from the down, from the underground. And uh, they, uh, they did a mistake because the, the mortar should be either nothing or up to, up to the corners to have uh, some space that can, uh, the water can distribute somewhere. Because uh, we have much more space in the corners which this is much more open because it's uh, either stucco or stone and it's uh, covered with, uh, with the uh, 
flashing here. So this is a point where the uh, evaporation could uh, could uh, start without damages in in this position because you can easily recognize where is the layer of the uh, of the motion. And of course, the best thing is to cut it. It's a uh, but. Uh, this is very controversial, probably in Prague would not be possible to do, this is an example from Austria. I personally am not against if it's exactly in the joint, so and uh, then uh, it's, it's really the 100% the sure that there is no more rising dam happening. Consolidation is very important how to make consolidation. This is a strength profile of any stone. You see that because of always the, the surface is quite strong and the main deterioration is few millimeters under the, under the surface. So once we start to consolidate the stone, we must be sure that we do not consolidate only the surface layer, but that we anchor this part to this sound stone to reconnect this uh, very fragile area. There are, gra oh, there are graphs of uh, successful consolidation and unsuccessful consolidation, you see, because if we consolidate only the surface, we may even worse than without any consolidation. So this is, we, we always have some decrease in, in, in the strength. And uh, this is uh, uh, Gothic part of the first convent in, in Czech uh, Republic from the 11th century. And you, you can see that uh, it's exactly what I was speaking about. The, the upper part is sound, it looks perfect, but there is nothing underneath. You know, there is a very big decrease in power in between the first layer and internal layer. What is important here is to make a good consolidation uh, a good injection prior to the to do uh, aerial consolidation. So any cracks has to be routed, injected, and you see how the uh, the the consolidant uh, because we pushed the syringes to to the joints, for example here, and it goes underneath and uh, fill in all cracks to be connected together. And at the end, it's. Uh, <coughs> It's sealed by, by Patti, which was here doing by uh, uh, acrylic Patti with very uh, high uh, grains of, of sand. Joints are very uh, problematic also. <laughs> Joints uh, are like a gate to the, to the fortress. You know, if you have a good gate, so there is nothing happens. If you have a bad gate, so the, the damage starts uh, very fast. And it, this is very important to have a good, uh, good system for joints. This is uh, what, we could, uh, what we found on San Vitos. They, we found four different kind of joints. This was very uh, educative. And uh, I like this picture because we can uh, we did a test for the, we, we did a laboratory test for this, so we know which period of time which uh, material comes from, and uh, we discovered that even the the first layer from 14th century is still there, in perfect condition. So it's only the way <coughs> of the processing. If we have the good craftsmen that they prepare the joint perfectly the, the, uh, the for the pointing, so it's almost forever. And any problems in the uh, in, uh, joint filling, and, uh, it's, uh, it's that was either badly prepared stone, or badly chosen rock, or, uh, you know, bad, uh, badly uh, chosen uh, mortar, which is very hard, it's hard, now it's this joint mortar is harder than the stone itself, so then it cracks. So this is this is no comment here. <laughs> and uh, so it's always the the way uh, of the craftsman how 
he will prepare the, the support and how he will organize the work. Uh, the mortar must be wetted at least two weeks, at least twice a day, and then the joint mortar is perfect. If you stop wetting and you interrupt the carbonization of the mortar, that the problem starts and this is not then uh, effective. This is traditional method how to make a treatment of joints because in Gothic times they used wood to, to scratch it, not to be very, uh, very polished, to, to let the, the, the grain open and to be able to evaporate the, 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 the mortar. And this is also a bad example of, of using uh, a combination of stone and, 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 and mortar. This is Clam Galas Palace in Prague. This is another uh, use of modern products to the old, old uh, system. This is these hands and the heads are made from micro balloons. Uh, stuff, it's a micro balance and epoxy resin, it's, uh, it's uh, the mass, um, it's uh, 10 times lighter than water, <laughs> so it's very very light because uh, the condition of the support for the statues was so bad that if we will make new, uh, ha new uh, hands and put it to the deteriorated uh, stone, it would fall, fall down, so we had the only idea how uh, only only possibility how to make it was to 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 discover some material that will be light and that will be uh, that will be uh, more or less same look like the original stone. You see that this is not filled, so uh, this was very conservative, uh, puristic we call puristic approach. Uh, must say in this this time that I'm not uh, able to decide by myself how I do it. So I just make a proposal, and our historian is coming, and he must prove it or not prove it. And it depends sometimes who is the our historian from the institute, the supervisor, because they are also different people. And so that's why you can see in one city different approaches, which is not bad in the in the way. Once uh, it's not damaging uh, process, uh, then it's, it's not a problem. In this case, uh, I, I was not very condemned because I would feel it more, but in a, in a way, for art history, it's much better that you can see the real historical uh, object and not this addition that nobody knows which period of time it comes from. This is another building with graffito, you know, so even though that yeah. It could be completed, so it was decided not to complete, not to, not to change the mind of people because what is original, what is not. You see the cornice is not finished, there is new, new cornice from later stages of the, of the house. So there are approaches different and uh, we can say yes and or no, but we must accept it because it's not bad. In, in a way for, for the material. I, if I speak about material, so I'm, I'm happy like this. Less intervention, if, if I said so, is better intervention. Also, the substitution, this is a, another question. If we put new stones, you see this before and after, it is striking, it's, a, it's a very wide. And to paint it artificially, or to let it paint by nature, in, hundred years. And this is also the question and in some cases, uh, in some cities they paint it, in some cities like Prague they don't paint it and uh, this is upon anybody who have to, there is no, no, no good judge for, for this. But uh, personally me, I, I would make some retouchment. And this is, uh, I, I, I put this uh, picture because I, I knew that I go to College of Architecture. <laughs> and there are some examples of uh, what we call regotization. So, and this is not a new idea because uh, it started in 19th century. 
and uh, people uh, say maybe it would be more gothic than it is <laughs> and even gothic structure were uh, more uh, you, um, reconstructed in, in better gothic you know. yeah. and this is most co sorry most controversially uh, controversially uh, project uh, the bell house the bell house in 1900 was like this and this is the same picture from 1900 and this is the present uh, situation and uh, of course the base is 14th century house but the roof is completely new <laughs> nobody knew how was the roof this is the project from 1986 and I don't think that could happen now <laughs> but in uh, any case uh, we visited the house together with students you, you would see it and now you, you will see that there was a quite good quality baroque facade before that is completely gone and uh, nobody can re-baroque re this, this, this stuff so from my point of view it's a very big mistake but if it happens so on the other, on the other side I must point your interest to how the designer was playing with the facade because once they cleaned everything there was nothing left and so there was just nice stone building but uh, no aspect of gothics so and uh, the, the artist made this as a negative according to what uh, according to analogical buildings so uh, this is completely new you see new, new ashlers of, of stone and uh, they cut the traces of possible uh, architectural element into the facade but as a, in the negative forms which I mean it's a very good idea and genius idea for me because it's, it's, it's really they saved uh, their skin by, by this intervention and this is uh, another, this is a 14th century castle of the uh, Bohemian king Charles IV, uh, built in, 14, in 1345. Oh. And uh, this is, uh, the roof is the same like it was in the 1986. So you see already in 1890 they tried to make it more gothic than it was. And I have some more examples from city of Prague. This is 1856 powder tower. And you see the, the facade is same. There is nothing uh, changed but these uh, arches. Uh, but the roof was completely different. And uh, this happened uh, in 1819, between 1819 and 900s. And this is the last example, I think, it's a Benedictine monastery in Prague, in uh, how the rule was changing in the course of, uh, of the time. You see the spires here, spires here, and in April 1945 was bombed. And there was a big risk, almost nothing left, you see, it was very, very heavily, heavily damaged. And this is the present situation, so the modern aspect and uh, everybody smiles and I said, what? But <laughs> I lived just next block from here <laughs> and I was uh, passing every day and after several years I said, wow, this is perfect, it's not so bad. <laughs> because it was completely destroyed and why not to use, from, from my point of view, it's a good quality architecture, it was in uh, 1956 design 1958 was executed so it was considered as a good example you have mostly bad example but this is a good example well this is a, to sum up uh, the uh, i'm running quite slow yeah may i have more time yes <laughs> yes <laughs> good <laughs> so uh, this is to sum up the principles the maximum authenticity is the, the main principle of any conservation, any, any intervention. Reasonable safety and reliability, second. Uh, I would like to point your interest of ECOMOS Iskarsach Charter, which is principles for the analysis, conservation, structural restoration of architectural heritage 
this is a very important document that uh, say a lot of things and uh, I, I do recommend to, to have it because for, architect, for historic architecture and for reconstruction it's quite important document to, to follow. And of course high grade of durability is a very important principle for any treatment. Well, now I prepare three case of studies, uh, case studies of, uh, of project that uh, I was uh, part of it and I would like to, to, to show it. This is San Barbara Cathedral. It's a huge cathedral, unfinished, because there is still any cathedral in the Europe is unfinished. I, I think <laughs> also San Vitus was finished in 1929, so started to build up set in 48 and was finished in 1929. And this, uh, this is a very similar, uh, similar case. And uh, I will show you how we follow the project from the beginning to the end. The first step is documentation, of course, archival documentation and, uh, and uh, gathering all information possible. Because here, the, the main problem was that this buttress moved aside and opened the walls and there was a real threat that will this uh, southwestern part of the cathedral will collapse and probably there was all from the very beginning there was a problem because you see there's uh, Jan Pale is the son of Peter Pale the famous architect uh, he started to build set in 88 but end of construction is 1588 by Benedict Reed but you see only six years after completion, the first reaper started. And there's a lot of reapers during uh, centuries, and these were always done in this position. And uh, the, the major reconstruction was between 1884 and 1905 by Josef Mokre. Actually, Josef Mokre is uh, the most famous Czech architect of late 19th century who is responsible for all, of all these towers I, I, I showed you before. He was a chief architect for the, uh, in that way, Austro-Hungarian Empire section, Bohemia Kingdom. <laughs> and so he, he, he had the so big power, he, what he decided it was done. And, but in this case he did a quite a good work, I will show you later. Uh, it's, 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 I will explain a little bit more. And uh, so, to, uh, uh, to make a good project, it's, it's uh, the documentation, to know what rock is it, what period of time, who was participating uh, under construction, like we have historic craft, craft marks, and to prepare a very precise uh, structure and building history research, if, because if you start to remove something, you must be sure that nothing will collapse. <coughs> we have uh, to do very intensive petrological study uh, to again recognize where there are the possible problems in deterioration of stone because you see the reconnection of different rocks are very frequent here. We have to make a good uh, uh, system of what is more and what is less deteriorated. We have to make a good mapping of uh, failures and a uh, good design for repairs. And last but not least, a good research of front layers, the, the surface layer, because these are the most important information from historic point of view. And Gothic was very colorful and now Gothic is very puristic and any traces of any pigments is extremely important for, for our present knowledge. So we cannot avoid any possibility to, to find out what is, what, how was it looked like in the, in the past. And there is of course photo documentation before the project started, so you see a lot of problems and mostly in very tiny areas it's also, I discussed the connection again, limestone sandstone program here. And determination of movement. So we, uh, we checked different, we modeled different possibilities, how the structure could move aside, rotation, 
what was the main reason why these flying arches were moved and and uh, this is very important aspect from Josef Mocker who designed different shape of the, the base uh, stones. So this is design of a reed from 1512, this is by Mocker 1890 and in the next you see the profiles. So this is uh, uh, from reed and this is Mocker and this is how it is changed. So reed made the upper upper world much more thick means much more heavy and so the load was extreme and that's why that was pushing down uh, the, the system and was a little bit opening uh, of the old structure and you see the result here there were almost five centimeters openings in the in the in the flying arches which is just the limit before it starts to collapse but this was not the only case the the, the other case was the temperature and uh, at the end the temperature changes were distinct they were determined as a, as a principal problem of this uh, because it's a southern part and you see the there's a difference here uh, 15.7, 9.5 and this is quite extreme difference in, in temperature and if you have cycles like this every day, every year, every century, 700 years, so it, it will cause a real, it can cause a real problem. So this was at the end determined as a combination of thermal expansion and contraction and high load of upper flying arches to the support. There are some pictures of uh, uh, originally there was uh, joints made from lead. It's, this was very typical for, for medieval times. And this is an uh, area that has been completely uh, not uh, replaced but completely strengthened by system what we call uh, using the uh, structure reinforcement by spiral uh, rods, stainless steel spiral rods, and there is uh, the design of system how the drills were directed into the uh, stone, into the stone uh, pieces. This is the design of drill location, so it was mathematically calculated where we are allowed to drill it, not to make more damage, and of course we had to have all arches uh, preventively fastened to it was uh, with a special no crane can come there so this was a system of very uh, empiric uh, ideas to just how to how to save the construction when drilling and and changing some 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 part this is uh, you see the spiral rods that is uh, connecting together each block of, uh, of, uh, of stone together. On the northern part there was a flying arch that was completely uh, corroded and was decided to change it in completeness in, com in, in its completeness and uh, there were very backed cracking that in this position would not be chance to be conserved to consolidate. So that's why we, we did some tests for, for durability for, for stone and uh, this is, these are some uh, pictures from, from replacement of, of the arch. This is the lower arch to, to, that has to be supported. Then uh, the upper part uh, arch was slowly uh, dismantled these are new uh, cut it, uh, elements uh, taking up, up uh, with the hand crane it's called. and then it, it was put together I would like to point your interest that inside the church there was very simple measuring 
system for if the wall is not moving when the uh, flying arch was dismantled. So we had a permanent control if there is some movements inside the, the inside the church. And this is uh, at the end. So uh, was complete completely exchanged from here up here. Okay. Another problem was this is 19th century closing because the, 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 the only section was 19th century, the remaining 12 or 13 sections were Gothic. And they, the problem was that they, don't, they didn't use big ashlars of, of stone, they used very small ashlars. And they designed, the, 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 actually it was designed by, by medieval architects, but the, the, the window is too large and the wall was not stable enough and we could see the cracks in the middle of the of the window and you see that this uh, parapet was sink down there were already exchanges of uh, little stone in the past so there was a problem since the very beginning that the stability was not enough so but we could not do anything in this case but to, to dismantle all facade which is not possible so we have monitoring system now if there is any movement and uh, it's uh, just we can monitor nothing more and there are some new parts uh, we use always lead flashing in any uh, because it's it's uh, it's very plastic and doesn't uh, uh, harm the, the site and it's it's uh, it's very uh, organically uh, incorporated into the into uh, into the uh, old structure building. What is important because we are very much to the north, we uh, changed the ethics, the drainage, and we made electrical heating. Uh, this uh, for for snow and to prevent any uh, cracking during the ice uh, expansion. And there are also these beams. It's uh, just to keep the snow not to slip down fast and to de destroy the, uh, the the hand railings here. Uh, this is very extraordinary roof. It's a, it's a very original, even for the Gothic architecture, and uh, it's it's uh, it's really something uh, very un unusual and, and beautiful. And that is a view from the west after the, uh, we finish the restoration. And this is from the north. It's, uh, it's lightning. It's, <laughs> it's a very beautiful mm -hmm. piece. And you see that the roof is really uh, very unusual. I go now to the 20th century structure building. This is, uh, I choose this because <laughs> I'm in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> And because of all, uh, this is very extraordinary building because it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's called Versailles uh, Versailles Star uh, uh, Monument. It was uh, built in 1928, and uh, it's also it's a retro style of uh, Baroque, early Baroque, late Renaissance, late Renaissance, sorry. And uh, the problem is in any modern building, I already mentioned in some discussion uh, yesterday or day before yesterday, that the most difficult thing is to restore the new structures. And this is uh, the concrete uh, structure, base structure, enveloped by different materials. And um, architect is Max Spielmann, he was a very famous Austrian architect, uh, very active in Vienna and Bavaria and uh, he has only four buildings in Prague and all buildings in Prague was uh, uh, designed for Pechek family. Pechek family was the, one of the richest family in the 19th, 19th century and uh, he, uh, his business was coal mining and we have just coal, we don't have oil, sorry, <laughs> that's why he was the richest man in the kingdom. And, uh, so he could afford what, whatever he wanted, and uh, so he, he, he let design to have a villa from concrete enveloped with the gypsum plaster, because gypsum plaster you can polish, like stucco lustra, and uh, 
but what is possible to use in Mediterranean with no winters, it's not possible to, to, to incorporate into the North Country. So the result was very soon after completion was cracking of the gypsum due to the expansion and contraction in winter. And uh, in 2006, uh, the, the facade was completely gone. It was uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, falling down in pieces, large pieces of the facade down. And this was uh, the, the ideas, uh, what we discovered. So, uncommon stucco system ba based on polished gypsum mortar. So, how to, how to treat it? Because this was a very original idea. We have never met such a thing in, in uh, Northern Europe because nobody used gypsum for, for, uh, for exterior. And so, we have to choose material that we can replace uh, the, the gypsum material, but with the same visual effect, which is not very easy to, to substitute gypsum uh, with lime mortars and uh, to, to let it polish. So you, you cannot uh, polish a mortar made from lime and sand. And so this was a very long investigation and uh, we uh, uh, this is a facade, this is a quite large facade, so it's, it was not just a piece of, of mortar, so it was hundreds and hundreds square meters what we had to substitute. And there are some, some more uh, uh, details of uh, decorated stucco elements. Also, the os elements, uh, the, the, the decoration was made from the same material. You see the, the, uh, uh, the condition was really very, very bad. And the gypsum crust again here because uh, of, of gypsum mortar, salt fluorescence, very intensive. And this is a system how they envelope the, the um, concrete body with the, with the gypsum. was partly done on site and partly handmade uh, uh, and prepared in, 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 in the workshops. And uh, so you, you see that uh, they made uh, cornices like this, or also lintels. This was done in, in the workshop. They glued it on the facade, and then they, they uh, applied uh, the, the gypsum and they polished it. So we checked a lot, a lot of uh, ready mix and at the end I, I, I went to the, uh, to the factory and was participating to mixing uh, because we have to, uh, to make such a particle size distribution of grains to be able to polish, to be able to, to, to be open for, for evaporation of water and to be able also to be cut in very precise form because we had to produce also these elements I, I mentioned before. So we made a stucco adhesion test and a lot of investigation, the grinding tests for new materials. And uh, the, the, the other problem was that if you apply uh, mortar, lime mortar, uh, to some surface, there must not be any traces of gypsum. So the most uh, the worst work that happened was to clean the, the, gyp the <laughs> gypsum, from, uh, the concrete from the gypsum. It was very noisy and uh, <laughs> if you imagine that we did it, uh, the, the ambassador was inside and, so <laughs> <laughs> and they were so, the, the family was so polite that they never, <laughs> they never complained, so I don't mind. <laughs> Yeah, this is to go area after removal. Then there were some repairs of cracks uh, to uh, not to be uh, again in a new new crack. And we invented the application of layers to be able to to grind it and polish at the end. And this was quite long process and very sophisticated. It uh, we put in three layers. And uh, this is lime mortar specially prepared according to the color, texture and uh, uh, workability. And the first layer was very thin layer, 
this, uh, this propylene, polypropylene net to, uh, to distribute any tensions from, from underneath. This is a detail of uh, first layer after application. It's about three, four millimeters maximum. This is uh, detail of how was it applied. And the majority of load of the, of the, of the material has to be done as fast as possible, not, not to have connection with uncured uh, material. So we didn't have to, uh, uh, to, to have uh, borders and connection in the, in the large facade. So that's why we use a very fast system uh, with the, the machinery. And then we have to also fast to, to make it uh, plain. plain. After setting, the, the second layer was uh, uh, very intensively rounded and even to, to make it very even and very precise uh, surface because the last layer is very thin and if we grind thin layer, we can grind over the, 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 the layer to the, to the support which would not be possible here. And uh, the last layer is then just, uh, it's, it's really, it's a two, three millimeters, very, very thin layer of the last. Uh, and we planed uh, by hydraulic grinding machine with uh, diamond, diamond uh, papers. And the result is good. It's six years after now, and it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, this, uh, sorry, this is, uh, uh, how we prevent the rising dam. Uh, so we, we drilled uh, all uh, surrounding area and uh, we injected the uh, uh, um, uh, silicone uh, system into the joints to make uh, like cutting uh, chemical, we can chemically say chemical cutting of the whole building. You see there are these uh, Parkers, I don't know in English how they call it. So every every uh, it's like ventil. The, you uh, pump through this uh, small tube the the material inside and uh, to to keep the moisture in in a certain position. And there are some. Uh, just I will go fast here. It's an example how we did the uh, stucco elements. So this is a detail of one of the and gen view of silicon mold. This is a molding in the craftsman laboratory. Then how we built uh, the, the special elements. The corners, this, uh, I know if you know how the uh, stucco work is, is doing, they, they do quite fast, but the corners has to be made by hand. It's not possible to go to the very end. So that was uh, handmade. This is uh, the cornices and the columns. This is uh, feet of columns. And then assembling of cast elements on facade. And there are these cast elements after assembling. So some, some of them were quite complicated. It was not easy to make from lime mortar, but we were succeeded in, in, in the end. And this is last uh, information from this building. There are uh, statues from a uh, special kind of concrete. It's a uh, limestone, this cement, which is also a bit unusual. And limestone, uh, again, was very much affected by, uh, by uh, acid rain. You see in the rain shadow, there are a lot of uh, black crust. Here, here is, is visible much better. Let's see. And this you have always before and after. And I just want to show you, this is another example. This is very important to, to, uh, to discuss the fingers, because on the fingers you can see how much material has left during the sol uh, solubility of, of the limestone. And this is almost difficult how to, <laughs> how to repair it, because uh, you cannot add just uh, one millimeter of material. It doesn't uh, doesn't uh, doesn't uh, keep together. So uh, this was quite 
big problem. We have to uh, use also some acrylics to help us to make a good putty for retouchment of these, these uh, statues. And this is Eastern Elevation before renovation and this is how it looks like now. And the whole project started in May and ended in November. So it was all facade has to be done very fast. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually the stucco work could start only after 1st of July, which is your holiday, because there was a big party on 1st of July. <laughs> so <laughs> the stucco, stucco work started 10th of July and ended uh, 15th of November. So it was <laughs> very, very fast work. <laughs> and this is after renovation. Well, if you have 10 minutes more, yes, <laughs> I, I have another, <laughs> the last case of study, because as you, as you mentioned, I am very active in the Middle East now, and this was our major project, uh, which is also quite important from the point of view of uh, conservation of architecture, because we have to solve quite a lot of problems that were not very familiar to us. Uh, this minaret surely comes from 12th century, it's 1198, and I will go fast because we, we use a lot of method, mainly geophysical method, because the, the minaret is leaning and we didn't know why. And uh, the minaret uh, has without the top, so we also didn't know why the, the last piece of minaret fell down, is that 12 meters of minaret missing. And did you point out the citadel? Yes, this is citadel in the... In the <laughs> So we uh, use a lot of uh, geophysical methods to investigate, mainly seismic tomography, and we made uh, several models what could be the, the reason why, uh, the, why the minaret was moving. And we uh, also, because we knew that this, uh, the, the underground situation was, is very unstable, it's just a dust and some gravel, and there is no rock uh, anywhere, so, and, and uh, when you have a, a soil too uh, wet, so it starts to flow like, like, uh, like water. And this uh, was the main idea to, uh, to make, uh, uh, the design consists from two, two aspects, to reinforce the structure and to stabilize the underground situation. So that's why we, we did a lot of uh, investigation and to just to find out if there is some underground lacuna or some voids in the <coughs> underground situation. And uh, then we f fortunately find out that the situation is more or less stable and then just in one corner was uh, something wrong. So uh, we prepared uh, quite good, I mean very, uh, very uh, minimalistic uh, uh, design to, to how to how to reinforce. This is mathematical seismic models of Minaret Choli, and now we are 100 percent sure and 99 percent sure that was due to earthquake because there are no records in no archives because it's we are in Kurdistan and all archives were burned out and uh, there's very very little information left from this old complete area of northern Iraq. We have very precise analysis of building materials to know what is the mortar, and we found out that it's pure gypsum again here. And uh, so we uh, the, did uh, then we decided to use gypsum again, but gypsum that is modified with silicon uh, products to get to get a, a water repellent gypsum, not to not to face the same problems as they did. And before. Of course, we, we, we did a very precise photogrammetry and to, uh, um, to make a very precise documentation of each point, each uh, bricks, and each uh, remnants of old uh, um, decoration. And we uh, unrolled the, the uh, tubular, the, the, uh, the, the upper part of minaret, which helped us very much in recognition where is the main deteriorating aspect. You see the joints are completely washed away in, in this way. So you could finally, you could suddenly discover 
what is and where the, the water comes uh, very intensively inside the, the structure. We did a very uh, 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 long investigation in terms of uh, uh, digitalization because of the project for stabilization and virtual modeling. Because you see the main problem was that the system of minarets, you have an internal very dense base with outer shell which is not connected uh, in crosses, the bricks are not connected, it's just glued and this was completely separated from each other. You see there, there were uh, cracks up to 15 centimeters, really, really big, big cracks. Also inside there were cracks and this uh, particle, this horizontal cracks uh, show us that probably could be very intensive impact of big power that can happen only during an earthquake that was not just moving and floating on, on the un unstabilized uh, support. And this is uh, the process of reinforcement of the structure. So we drilled 100 centimeters, 120 centimeters deep uh, drills and incorporated uh, the, the stainless steel spiral bar. They were 2.8 per square meter altogether. There are some details of this. The, the, the upper part was roped with the, uh, in circles in, uh, along uh, the, the surface and fastened together. Also, the staircases were completely uh, connect, reconnected. And this is a design of, uh, 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 of uh, isolation of uh, the surrounding area to distribute the water, to put the water as fast from the mineral as possible. So there are two layers. You see there is uh, uh, one drainage underneath and the, the uh, heavy rain can go this way and what is sucking down it's, it's going to the uh, low drainage out of the space. And this is some images from the, uh, from the making the isolation of the area. There are all together 10 layers of different materials, mostly gravel, uh, woven textile, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and sheets to prevent any, so we can to be able to distribute any water from the, uh, from the base of the minaret. And then the paving and consolidation by ethyl silicates. And this is what I uh, want to speak because this is arch architectural point of, of this project. Uh, the niches along all minarets were very heavily deteriorated and uh, there were only pieces uh, that remained on site and some of the uh, architectural shape were also missing and we had to decide how, how to do it. To, if we have 12th century structure in Europe, we would not touch it. We just would conserve it to seal the, the cracks and leave it and, and, and maintain it. But in this uh, area, this was, uh, was not just possible. They wanted us even to <laughs> rebuild completely the, the minaret to the original positions, what I refused. And uh, they also asked me to, to make a reconstruction of tiles, the blue tiles, of, of the uh, inside of niches. But uh, this is uh, also my, uh, I, I call this, uh, I call this uh, a lecture compromise between science and experience, and this is exactly what I was meaning. So this uh, is a compromise of uh, what we what we could do and what we what we really did. And uh, so you see, we we finish, we finalize the architectural shape of the of the niches, but we didn't do anything inside because we don't we didn't know what what could be inside so uh, we never uh, well, if we, we if there are no good evidences of what the, the design of uh, of the decoration is i i, I really uh, prefer not to touch it and to conserve and to 
to make such intervention that if somebody in the future will find out how to do it, so he must be able to do it and not to, not to destroy what I did. So we just fill in, we, we made the frames, which is exactly visible because there are some, some other meshes, and we fill it, fill in the area with very neutral material that is compatible with other areas that are existing. And uh, we, of course, original fragments were very carefully, uh, very carefully restored but were not completed, were not touched, it's just conserved. In that time, I didn't know Rima, <laughs> I didn't know about quasi-crystals. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, two years ago, we met together, and, and uh, Rima prepared according to her uh, uh, new idea, uh, the idea how we could follow and how we could complete these niche niches. So, I'm happy very much now that uh, I didn't ma make a mistake and didn't fill it too much and maybe there will be some people, some newcomers and uh, craftsmen able to, to complete if there will be good design to, to do it. There are some uh, fragments also that has been uh, uh, restored and this is some images before and after. This is repointing. There were altogether 11 kilometers of repointing, which means about 7.5 miles. <laughs> it was very long and not very pleasant work. <laughs> and this is uh, this is uh, another problem. This is the because the the, the, the upper part is missing. The, there's a big opening for water, and we couldn't make a new roof. And even though we have uh, but on the other side, we have to do some roofing. But this roof should not be visible from any place in the city. And we asked uh, the architect to solve it. And we did uh, the, at the end the, the, the roof, which is in, uh, in, in there's double double roof going like this inside the minaret. And uh, the water, you see, water comes here and here, and there is a uh, drainage, cobbler, I don't know what you call it. And we used one, because there are two spiral staircases in the minaret, so we used one staircase as a technical staircase and we uh, made a drainage along the staircase going down into the drainage system that you could see before. And this is after completion, so you see that uh, it's completely covered inside, it's made from copper sheet, and uh, we let some windows for for maintenance to be to be open and to be crafted at the top. And you see there are stairs, and this pipe is uh, is uh, taking the, the water down to the drainage. We just had to complete a couple of layers of uh, of bricks on the top to be able to do this job. And uh, now this is how the roof looks like from the side, from the city. This is a before and after. So you see we add something like six rows of bricks to be able to uh, cover and to, to, to let the uh, roof to be hidden from the side. And the last, this, this was my victory, this was my loss here. <laughs> because uh, I, I studied minarets before I came to this project and every minaret has a very uh, low entrance, just about one meter, one meter twenty. And this was all entrances to the minaret were swollen like this, you could see like this. And if you see the niche, so one can think that it's something wrong here, that the, the, the entrance should be up here because the niche should be closed, this parapet right here, but there were no power to, to make them think about this because they, in every picture since 1920s, they have this size of, of openings and uh, this is my, uh, I'm very sorry that I didn't, I didn't manage to do it and to, to, to make them think about because I'm almost 100% sure that 
it's not like this. <laughs> and we, we designed also uh, uh, the grills for windows and leaves, and this is uh, the entrance to the mosque, the formal, which is okay. This size is perfect because we, we found also the uh, walls, but from the other side we, we didn't find it, uh, these walls and we uh, uh, reversibly we, we found some small bricks that may be uh, may may have been uh, the, the the board for this, and this is minaret after conservation. This is all. Thank you very much for your. <laughs>